There is only one reason that a ship has an anchor. It needs it to ride out storms. It needs it to keep it in place. It doesn't want to be blown off course. It doesn't want to be removed from where it is. And so a large ship and a small ship all have anchors to hold them in place. The writer of Hebrews is concerned about his children. I think he's a pastor. I think he writes the book like a pastor. And he writes it to the people and he says to them, I know you're in trouble. I know some of you are drifting. And the second and third chapter is talking about drifting away. I know that some of you are considering even going back to Judaism. And in the whole book he basically says, Jesus is all you'll ever need. You really need anything more than him? He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to the law. He's superior to everything that's ever been. Jesus is all you will ever need. And if, by the way, he is not all you need, there remains for you nothing. If Jesus is not enough, there is nothing for you. There are a lot, a lot of people who would say, you know, Hebrews talks about losing your salvation and getting it and all kinds of stuff like that. I guarantee you, if Jesus is not enough, you have nothing. Nothing. So you are left with no anchor. Left with nothing to keep you from drifting. Nothing to keep you in the storms of life. Now I want you to look with me at the book of Hebrews in chapter 6. And I want us to begin reading at verse 17. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 17. In the same way God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled from for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now I want you to look in here. There are two things I want you to see. There is an anchor and there is a place where the anchor is connected. Now if you throw an anchor out in a boat and it goes into mud, the anchor doesn't hold. It just doesn't hold. And the boat will drift. The anchor has to be into something solid, hard, that when the anchor dives in and hits, it doesn't move and it holds the entire ship steady. Now there's a picture here that, that the writer of Hebrews has about who the anchor is and where the anchor is. And he begins by saying that this anchor, this hope you have, is Jesus. He is the anchor of your soul. It is not your own intelligence. It is not your own hard work. It is not your persistence. It is not your determination. It is not your knowledge of the Bible. It is not all the things you've memorized. It is not your experience. The anchor of your soul is Jesus. Now there are a lot of people depending on a lot of other things to hold them steady. Some people hang on to friends. Some people hang on to relatives. Some people hang on to their understanding. There are lots of things people hang on to. But the only anchor that will hold your soul in the time of trouble is Jesus. The hope you have in him. Now I said to you that an anchor has to be in the right place to do any good. So where is this anchor placed? If you'll look at the text, Hebrew says... In verse 18, in order that two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters, enters 
Where is it? Where is the anchor? It enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner. He's in the presence of God. Your anchor is in heaven. It is not in this world. Come November 7th, your anchor is not in this government. Your anchor isn't in your bank. Your anchor isn't in the stock market. Your anchor isn't in your job. Your anchor isn't even in your health. Your anchor isn't in your wisdom. It's in Jesus and it's in heaven. Now what's neat about the anchor being in heaven? Nobody can mess with it. Nobody can mess with the anchor. Nobody can pull it out. Your anchor, your great hope, Jesus, is in heaven. And your life can be solid no matter how hard things are. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one in whom we establish our hope. Jesus never changes. This verse we read earlier in Hebrews, he does not lie. God does not lie. You can trust him. You can depend on him. He is the anchor. He's the one to keep you steady. He's the one to keep you from drifting. He's the one who keeps you right. This last week we heard news that a, a relative of ours, not real close, but a relative, through one, 29 years old, walked out of hospital, and now is lost, gone. No one knows where she is. She's a heroin addict. Does not look good. She has determined the anchor of her soul will be heroin. And it will kill her. There are others who think that only the devil understands them. People are looking for understanding today. today. Listen, God is the only one who knows us and who understands us. He is our anchor. When trouble comes, we turn to him. Listen to Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. The psalmist says, I depend on God alone. What are you depending on? I depend on God alone. That's what the psalmist says. I don't depend on anything else. What's your anchor? What are you really depending on? You know why you get upset with family that doesn't come through when you want them to? Because you're depending on them. You know why when you think something's going to turn out right and it doesn't? And uh, you're depending on the stock market to go up and it goes down? Listen, our, our lives are full of frustrations. They're full of difficulties, full of troubles. And most of it is because we depend on the wrong things. I was depending on you and you didn't come through. I depend on the Father and he always comes through. Amen? He always comes through. The psalmist says, I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender. I shall never be defeated. My salvation and honor depend on God. He is my strength. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. Trust in God at all times, my people. Tell him all your troubles, for he is our refuge. God is our refuge. We sing that song, God is my refuge, God is my strength. A very present help in time of trouble. But is he? You see, the church is full of whiners today. Complainers. Why didn't? Why doesn't? What if? Why not? Instead of hopeful people saying, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. I can depend on him. We tend to think that means that everything's going to work out. Everything doesn't work out like we think. The only thing works out is God's will. That works out. Now what's his will for you? What's his will for me? What is it that God is wanting to accomplish in us? He wants to make us like Jesus. He doesn't care if the stock market rises, falls. He doesn't care about those silly things, he has one goal in mind, to make us like Christ. And as many as people as turn their hearts to him, he will, in no, he will in no way turn them away. 
whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Problem is, they don't all call. But if a person does call, he saves them. And if a person turns their heart to him, he gives them eternal life. And he becomes their protector and their guard. You would think David wrote this, I depend on God alone. You would think, well, he's probably written that from his throne room. From his throne room where everything's going well and the armies are all there and he's won every battle. No, no, David wrote these kind of things when he was in the cave running from Saul. When he was struggling, when things weren't going right, he continued to say, no matter how it looks, I depend on God. Why do you think God called him a man after my own heart? Because in the midst of his trouble, he never griped and complained. He never questioned God's character. How many times have you and I said, Oh God, come on, where are you? When are you going to answer? When are you going to do what I need? You know, it's off. I wonder if God sits in heaven and smiles and thinks, Oh kids, <laughs> you two year old having a tantrum. What am I gonna do? What do you do when your two-year-old has a tantrum? Give it what they want? No. God doesn't either. We're like two-year-olds having tantrums, trying to control God to get what we want. We want to be God. We don't really trust Him, we trust ourselves. I know what I want, I know what I need. I know the kind of people I want around me. I know the kind of things I want. I know the I know the kind of phone I want. It's all about what we want. Instead of, I depend on God. Maybe God wants you to be poor. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about that? Most Americans don't think like that. They think the American dream and the, and the Christian dream are the same thing. That somehow getting wealth is, is God's will. And obviously poor is not God's will. Really. Tell that to the millions of people around the world who walk with Jesus and, and for Jesus and have very little. Tell that to Andrew in Bangladesh, that somehow he's not obedient to God and God doesn't love him like he loves America because he, can't, he doesn't have air conditioning. When it's 95 out there, he's sweating. Where did we get the notion that somehow getting things in this world is God's will? So when things don't work out the way we want, and we don't get what we want, all of a sudden we're upset and where is God? And the psalmist says, I depend on God alone. He is my refuge and strength. He is my defender. He is the one. It is about him. Listen, God's goal for you is that in your life, he gets his glory. That's really hard for us, especially as Americans, to say that somebody else gets what we need or want. We think we deserve it. But in the end, you are here to show him. You show his glory to other people. Why are you supposed to do good works? What does Jesus say? Do you remember? You remember what Jesus said about good works? Do you remember? Do you remember? Jesus said, let your, good, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and pat you on the back. No? Oh, you know that's not it, huh? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works so that they will give glory to God. So that they would look to Him. We depend on Him. So He gets the glory in our lives. God answers a prayer and we say, Amen, thank you, Lord. Praise be to you that you would do that for a wicked person as I am, for as sinful as I am, and that you would actually answer my prayer. Oh, God, you are a great and mighty God. That ought to be the cry of our heart, not, I deserve this. Or how come God didn't do this? Whiny, ungrateful children. But David said, no, no, I depend on God. He is the anchor of our soul, and that anchor is in heaven. Now, there is what I believe uh, a an untruth being taught today and maybe a long time and it's from 1 Corinthians 10 13 and how many of you have that memorized 1 Corinthians 10 13 how many of you don't have a clue what that verse says 
There is no temptation taking you, such as common to man. And God will not allow you to be tempted about what, you, what you're able. But God is faithful and will provide for you a way of escape so that you won't, won't be able to bear it. What does he mean by that? Listen, people have interpreted God will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to mean you won't have any trouble that you can't handle. Right? God will not let any trouble come to you that you can't handle. And that is not what that verse says. What that verse says is, when you do have trouble, God will be there. And you'll be able to handle it. But if you think life as a Christian is about, I, I can handle anything that comes my way because I, I, I'm, I can do that. You are mistaken. I think God is in the process of putting things into your life that make you desperately in search of him. So that you will say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what Paul said. He didn't say no trouble's coming you that you can't handle or, or this and God, this is, God's not going to, that's not going to happen to you. My friend in Ohio now has cancer and going through, going through chemo for six months of chemo every week has not complained yet once just said oh God you are my strength and said God will take me through this I want to give you some reasons why God allows you to have and me to have very very difficult situations sometimes it's physical sometimes it's relational sometimes it's it's with your job sometimes it's with family sometimes it's it's just financial there are all kinds of things that happen to us and I think God does allows things to happen to us that are way past what we're able to handle. Way beyond what we can accomplish, what we can do. Why? Well, first of all, so we will rely on him. Number one, so we can depend on him. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him. He cares for you. We have to learn to depend on him. That is really hard for us to do, isn't it? Because, see, we are in a country where we do it ourselves. And we are taught, I can do this. It shows itself in people don't ask for prayer. Right? Tony shares a prayer. This morning, we all pray. We're going to be praying for Phyllis. We're going to be praying out for your family, for Jasmine, for all of that. We're going to be praying... Why does a person share a prayer request? Because I can't handle this on my own. I need God. Amen? I need help. But boy, if you're not willing to say, I need help, you are left in your arrogant, prideful place alone. Because God honors the humble, not the proud. It is the humble to whom he speaks. It's the humble who say, oh God, I need you. Now some people, they approach this relying on God as a default. No, not a default, as a last resort. Excuse me, long, long term. The default ought to be, oh God, help me. But that is not the default for most. For most people, the default is, I do my best, I work hard, I try this, I try that, I try this, I try that. And then all of a sudden, well, okay, God, I guess I'll turn to you. No. When you have trouble, get to your knees. Get to your knees. You have no idea what God can accomplish. But you go first to him, not last. Don't make God your last resort. Learn to rely on him. God brings trouble. So we'll see who really can accomplish things in our lives. One man said one, I think it was Ventura said one time, uh, you Christians, a bunch of weak people, depend on other people. Yeah, he's just arrogant. He has no idea that he'll need to depend on God one day. That he'll face God and God will say, you didn't bow your knee to me, so there's where you go. But everyone who bows their knee to Jesus they, and to God, they go into, into heaven with him. So it takes first humility. You learn to rely. Second thing, why does God bring difficult things? So, you, so we can tell us, so he can tell us 
things we wouldn't know otherwise. You know, there's just some things you're not going to know about God and about life and about yourself without trouble. Trouble forces you to pray and forces you to Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. You don't find some things out until you get on your knees and pray. You say, oh God, what's happening? Oh Lord, why have I done this? Lord, why did I do this? Why did I, why is this happening to me? Oh God, I rely on you. I depend on you. What's going on, God? And the Lord will speak to you. And he'll tell you things. You'll go, oh, oh, I see. Trouble and difficulties you can't handle help you find out things you would never have known otherwise. Never. How will you know? How will your faith ever be tested until it's tested in a way where you can't do it? You get on your knees and you say, oh God, what am I going to do? Oh Lord, help me. And all of a sudden, God begins to speak. What does God want you to do? What is God saying? What does he want? Why is this thing here? Don't gripe. Oh God, why is this? Why is this happening to me? My goodness. Get on your knees and say, oh God, without you, I can't, I'm going to fail. Without you, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go under. Oh God, my boat is floating out here and it's, it's running off into the rocks. Oh God, what's wrong? Lord, I trust you. I love you. But don't whine. He'll open your eyes. God does not open the eyes of whiners. He opens the eyes of the faithful. Those that turn to him and say, Oh God, I trust you. I don't understand. Did I do something wrong? Somebody else do something? Lord, I don't know. Show me. Let God show you. I don't know everything. Do you? I'm not sure what happened yesterday. I'm not sure what's going on today. And I'm certainly not sure of what's going to go on tomorrow. And yet we depend on ourselves and our own intellect. You need to hear from God. Number three. I think God wants to be gracious to us. How is God going to be gracious? Grace, by the way, God's riches at Christ's expense. God gives us of his own character, of his own compassion and his own his own abilities he gives to us when we don't deserve it and when he gives us something we don't deserve we call it grace he can show us grace he shows us grace when we turn to him and we say oh god this this financial trouble i mean oh god help me help me and then somebody walks up to you and says hey we're having dave ramsey you want to come you go oh lord thank you somebody's going to help me but you have to be desperate and on your knees. Listen to what, what he says in Isaiah 30, 18. I love this verse. Therefore the Lord longs, longs to be gracious. You know when somebody is longing to be gracious? You know what that longing means? When the Bible says God is longing to be gracious, that means he's, oh, I, I, oh, 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 I want to give, I want to give this, oh, oh here, oh, you just ask, oh. That's being longing. I mean, that's God saying, I want to do this. Most people think God's more like this. They ain't getting it. Big. Big. Maybe I'll think about it. That's the way people think about God. That somehow that's the way God is. No, he is longing to be gracious. But he's not going to be gracious to the whining, complaining, and people who aren't trusting. He's longing to be gracious because he's waiting. It's like the rich, the, the man whose son went off and took his, took his inheritance, and we call him the prodigal son, and he went off. And the father waited and waited and waited and was looking afar and saw his son coming and ran to his son. And he was longing to hold him and hug him, longing to show him grace. And when he finally got to show him grace, he gave him a ring on his finger, clothes on his back, and had a great big party for him. Because God is longing to be gracious to us. And in trouble, we find grace. You don't need God's grace when everything's going well, do you? 
You certainly don't ask for it. Number four. I think God can demonstrate his strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may, be, may dwell in me. Listen, your trouble drives you to your knees, drives you to love God, drives you to enjoy Him, allows Him to show His grace and demonstrate His power on your behalf. God is not interested and will not demonstrate power when we are not bowed before Him humbly, depending on Him. But His power, He wants to demonstrate it. He wants to show you He can be there. He's going to be there for you. He's going to be there. He's going to demonstrate his power. You rely on him. You depend on him. And sure enough, God doesn't lie. He takes care of it. Now listen, if we have a result we demand from God, now that's a different story. That's not faith. I ask, you know the old story, I asked God for $1,000 and I didn't get it. I'm only going to trust God ever again. Well, there you go. Tell God what he has to do and then wonder why he doesn't do it. You do not set the agenda for God. You become God like that. He becomes your slave. We are his slave. We don't tell the master what to do. We trust the master to take care of us. And when the master brings out us something in a bowl and says, eat this, we eat that. Because we trust him. Yeah, but I wanted chicken. This is what you need. Well, I wouldn't have said chicken. Sorry, Thomas. I want steak. Medium rare, please. Just above mooing. I want steak. And the Lord said, no, you're getting this. Well, I want that. Wow. Who becomes God? Well, I do. Now, if you have an agenda, I want God to do this. I want God to heal this. I want God to fix this. I want this trouble gone. I want that person removed, Lord. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. You do that, and I'm guaranteeing you, you're not going to hear God. You're not going to see God. You're not going to see his power. You're not going to see anything. Because you've become God. But when you stand back and say, God, do whatever you need in my life. My goal is for you to be glorified in my life. And whatever you want is fine with me. I depend on you. Show your strength in me. And my goodness, what God does inside, people will see. An old lady got saved. A grandmother. Sat in her living room. Led her to Jesus. You know why she got saved? She watched her granddaughter die. Her granddaughter died at 16 of leukemia. And that grandmother called me and said, I want what my granddaughter had. And she died. And I said, I can give you what she had. She had Jesus. She died gloriously. But she had Jesus. And that grandmother knelt in her living room by her coffee table and gave her life to Jesus. And she got what her granddaughter had. Hope. She got Jesus. Don't set the agenda for God. He can demonstrate his strength. You know, I've often wondered about that little gal. If she was laying in, in bed there in the hospital as I went and saw her so many times. I wondered if she sat there and said, Oh God, my grandma doesn't know you. And then in heaven, the moments later, as she sits in heaven and goes, yes, it was worth it all. Now that's God's strength. The fifth thing, so he can produce character and hope in us. Listen to Romans 5, 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulation. You understand exalt in our tribulation? We get Tribulation. We're excited in the midst of our trouble, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. 
there is purpose on all of this trouble you're in. And what you have to know is that God is allowing this because he wants to develop character and hope in you. Some of you are real characters already, right? But one, God wants to develop real character. His character. He wants you to become like Jesus. And trouble does it better than anything else. You know what the problem is? J James says, I'm trying to remember the right book. James says, the anger of man does not accomplish the will of God. If you get upset and complain, the anger of man does not accomplish the will of God. You don't become like Jesus. You just become that griping, complaining person that everybody goes, oh boy, there he is. There she is. <gasps> oh dear. Why? Because you have not allowed the trouble to make you like Jesus. Stop your complaining and get on your knees and trust him. It'll develop character in you. Character is developed over time. You do know that one of the most expensive things in the world is a diamond, right? And all you men go out there and buy the biggest rock you can for your woman, right? No. Most of you guys went out and bought whatever you could afford, right? But you got a diamond most of the time, or something like it anyway. You know how a diamond's formed. It's just a hunk of coal under lots of pressure. Make something worth immeasurable value by pressure. Well, that's what trouble is. It's pressure. And it pushes us to become like Christ. The sixth thing, so God's power is revealed. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power, this dynamic, dynamo power, will be of God and not from ourselves. People will look at you and say, how did you overcome that? How did you do that? How do you have joy in your life knowing well, all the trouble you're having? How do you smile? How do you have confidence? What is with you? If I had the trouble you had, I'd be angry and mad and I'd be furious and I'd be doing all kinds of things. What's with you? And you can say, it's the power of God in my life. God's power is at work in me. He gives me this dynamite of power that's explosive and it's able to take care of me. And God, you can, God can be seen in us. People can look at us and say, wow, what's with you? Now listen, I know there are lots of people who they think they've already seen all that. Listen, we live in a very skeptical world skeptical world especially in religion especially in Christianity they have so little power they've ever really seen in Christians last week I told you I had something on the website that said what the world really needs now is for people who claim themselves to be Christians to actually become disciples followers of Jesus so that they can be people whose power the power of God is exemplified in people who go through trouble and don't handle it like the rest of the world people who have a confidence about them a certainty about them a power beyond their own that they can say God has given me this to God be the glory who are outspoken about it and say you know why I'm happy you know why my husband and I get along so well you know why our marriage is so good you know why my kids are like they are I'm gonna tell you why they're like it's God's work it's what God is doing in me. It's his power that does this. You kids ought to be able to tell your friends at school. You ought to be able to say, hey, I'll tell you why I don't act the way the other kids act. I'll tell you why I don't react and get angry like the rest. Jesus has changed my life. What's wrong with you? Can't you say that? Well, maybe you don't really depend on him. God is at work. God is at work in us. The seventh thing so we can learn to comfort others. Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What is he saying? You have trouble? Find God's answer. You have trouble in your life. You have disappointment in your life. You have difficulty in your life. I have financial trouble. You have 
physical trouble. How have you found joy in the midst of that? You get up and give a testimony. I had the worst case of this in the world and God healed me. Okay, fine. But maybe you had the worst case you said, but I went through it all and remained happy and loved God with all of my heart. And I want to tell you, God proved himself in the midst of my trouble. It was so neat how I could just, just be in his presence and know he was taking care of me. I'm going to tell you something, people. You help other people when you learn how to go through something. When you didn't gripe and complain. When you didn't... I have a prayer request. Remember old Frank Favazza one time. I said, oh Frank, why don't you tell the church to pray for you? You know what Frank said? He said, I'm going through a serious financial trouble and it is not the time to say anything. I said, well when is the time? He said, when God has worked it all out. And it was horrible what he went through. Most of the people in church had no idea what he was going through. But what he did was he kept praising God and loving God. And when it was all done and said, he just said, praise God, and he went on with his life. But he could say to people, I know what it's like to be in such financial straits that you don't know whether you can even eat the next day. Nobody in church knew that. Nobody in church knew how bad it was. But what he did say was, my God took care of me. And when somebody goes through trouble, you can say, hey, I know what you're going through. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We went through that. We had a great loss. It was terrible. But God was so strong. God took care of me. Let me tell you how I made it through. And then you share what God did. And you're able to comfort them with the comfort that you received. But you only have comfort that you received if you depend on God. Not on yourself. The last thing. Why do we have trouble? So the gospel can be proclaimed. Philippians 1, 12 and 13 says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. His circumstances in jail for the gospel. In chains. So that my imprisonment in the, for the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. What was he saying? I'm imprisoned and the gospel is going to get spread. He didn't go to that jail complaining. He didn't go to that jail saying, oh, what was me? if I just hadn't said that, why did I do that? Why am I, why, oh God, have you abandoned me? Well, I'm in jail. What's the deal? I thought you wanted me to preach. How can I preach here? He didn't say any of that. Paul in jail simply said, I'm here so that the gospel can be proclaimed. And so the Praetorian Guard, the elite guard that were watching over him, he could witness to them and share the gospel. Can you imagine what it was like to being being in that prison, being a guard in that prison, and guarding Paul. Can you even imagine what that must have been like? Being chained to Paul so he couldn't get away. Can you imagine what Paul would have done? I, just, I don't know why I'm here. I was a good guy. I wanted to do everything good. I just had to help people. Really? Paul would have said, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. And the guy would have said, oh, you want to, Jesus, look where you are. We go, oh, yeah, but let me tell you what it's like inside. I'm free inside. I am free and I'm going to be free forever. I can be free of everything. You're not controlling me. If God wanted me to leave right now, I could leave. God's in control, not you. And I want you to know, God, could, God sent his son to die for you. God loves you. God wants you to set you free from your chains. Which chains do you have? What habits do you have God can set you free from? Can you imagine Paul beginning to witness to him? He didn't whine and complain about his situation. He simply talked about Jesus. That's why at the end he says, uh, has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. Guess what was well known? You get chained to Paul, you get a witness. You get to hear about Jesus. Oh my goodness, can you imagine some guy on Tuesday saying, Oh, it's my day. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to listen to Paul. First time. But you know, somebody gets saved, another one gets saved, and all of a sudden, there's lives being changed. And it might change to, Ooh, I get to, I get to sit with Paul today. 
I get to sit beside Paul. The gospel is proclaimed in the midst of trouble because of the way we handle the trouble. So will God allow you to have things you can't handle? Absolutely. Because you really can handle it with him. He can take care of it. If you can handle it, go ahead. Go ahead. Because God's going to bring things in your life you can't handle, so you will learn to trust him. So others will see Jesus. So you can be changed. So you can comfort others. So that the gospel will be spread. So God can show his power and his strength on your behalf. That's why you have trouble. Now, should you go after the service here and say, All right, Lord, hit me with all the trouble you want. Yeah, I kind of think maybe you should. Why not? You think you can't trust him? Why not? Why not say, okay, God, bring trouble in my life. You have a will in it. Do you think God would do that just to harm you? Do you think God is so evil that he would somehow just do something bad to you and leave you hanging? Now, I wouldn't suggest you go out and pray that prayer unless you are determined to say, God, whatever you bring, I will trust you and you'll take care of me. We have a God who takes care of us. Listen now to this last verse. Do we have that last verse? Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Let's bow our heads and pray.